Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 in a series of lectures on the Harvard Classics. We are now in Volume 2 and we'll be finishing with Volume 2. We, in the first part of Volume 2, gave our time energies to the dialogues of Plato. We mentioned Euthyphro because it's not actually in the second volume of the Harvard Classics. And then we talked about Plato's classic apology, then Crito, and then finally the final words of Socrates in Phaedo. We now will leave Plato, but not leave Plato. And we come to the last two thinkers in the second volume, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. We'll give individual lectures on both. Uh, both of these are qualified as what we call today Stoic philosophers, and Stoicism is in fact a kind of extension or adaptation on Platonic thought. So although we're leaving Plato, we don't actually leave Plato at all. The influence of Socrates and Plato through Aristotle, it cannot be overstated. Aristotle is the great student of Plato who critiques the ideas of Plato. For over, uh, many say at least 30 years Aristotle studied with Plato and he was given the right, boy this tells you what kind of teacher Plato must have been, he was given the right to challenge Plato's ideas as Plato had derived them from his time with Socrates. And clearly if Aristotle was given that kind of uh, leeway then Thinkers to follow would feel very comfortable in critiquing Plato, extending, adapting Plato's ideas, and we're obviously going to see we're going to see those uh, here. Now, when we turn to this study, there's any number of ways that I like to teach Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. The way I'm going to do it here with you is to point out that when you think about what it means to be a human, it seems that there's three questions which come to mind. Let's address each of them in order. And then let's turn to our study of first Epictetus and then in another lecture later, Marcus Aurelius. And let's pay attention to the ways in which these uh, questions are addressed. It seems to me these are fundamental questions to understanding the human existence. Let's talk about them each in their academic instantiation and then as well in their real life parlance. The first one is what we call the theodicy question, T-H. E-O-D-I-C-Y. Now, if you were with me for my Milton lecture earlier uh, in uh, room 303, you can find that one there on learnstrong.net. I talk about this question of theodicy. Let's remind ourselves what this is. We often will put it on the whiteboard, remember, with our triangle. We imagine that you walk into a hospital room with a child who is dying of leukemia and a mother there obviously distraught. And after you say to the mother, I am so sad for the fact that your child is dying of leukemia, the mother says, I know, I know. I wish that there was a God who was powerful enough to cure my daughter's cancer. And the response by you is, oh no, there is a God powerful enough to cure your daughter's cancer. To which the mother says, wow, well that must not be a very kind, loving God. Because if the God is powerful enough to cure my daughter's cancer, clearly my daughter is dying of cancer. And you say, oh, no, no, no. The same God is also loving, wants nothing more than to cure your daughter's cancer. You can understand why we put this in a triangle when we put it on the board. Because in the lower right corner, we're going to put evil, pain, suffering, bad stuff, child dying of leukemia and cancer. And on the other two corners of the triangle, we're going to put an all-powerful God or gods all loving on the other corner, God or gods, and we're asking somehow how you can explain how if there is an all-powerful, all-loving deity in the universe that there is the existence of evil. You can put it in your notes this way. The theodicy question is the question about evil in the universe. Why do bad things happen? Now, of course, some people have argued that this theodicy question is the end of all religion. In other words, the child dying of leukemia, of those, of those three things, is the only absolute certainty. Look, the kid's dying. On this other stuff, I don't know, you've got to make that stuff up and believe it or whatever. So it's the end of the idea of, of belief in religion and God. Other people have pointed out that, no, no, quite to the contrary, that question of theodicy is the beginning of all religion and belief in God. In other words, what makes a child dying of leukemia in and of itself necessarily bad or an evil? Hmm. We're going to see that in the Greek tradition, there's actually a couple of different answers that are provided. You can uh, study this on your own in more detail, but uh, for example, in Iliad 24, book 24, line around 5, uh, 527 or so, 
We're told that Zeus, King God, keeps two kind of casks or vases of, of, uh, of good in the one, bad in the other, and he kind of randomly decides which one humans will get. Kind of an explanation of when bad things happen, you're walking along the road and a rock hits you on the head and you get jacked. Well, you know, what was going on? Well, Zeus is kind of, you know, sometimes he gives you good, sometimes he gives you bad. The second argument from Greek, uh, the, the Homeric tales, uh, comes from uh, the Odyssey, book one, where Zeus himself will speak and he will kind of defend himself and say, men uh, bring evil on themselves by their choices. In other words, it's not my fault, it's humans. They make stupid choices and bad things happen, it's not my fault. Which, of course, is problematic when you, for example, raise questions about earthquakes. I mean, obviously, there's nothing humans can do to create earthquakes, or at least most of the time, nothing humans can do to create earthquakes. Therefore, when earthquakes happen, we think of the terrible Lisbon earthquake that led for Voltaire to write Candide, don't we? Uh, the question, obviously, is why? Like, wh what's, what's going on? The theodicy question, number one. Number two, there's the what we will call ethics question. Uh, the, the easiest way I know how to say this one is, um, why treat stupid people kind? We're going to hear from Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, as well as a lot of other thinkers that we've already m mentioned, Plato. Uh, this is one of the penultimate questions. Of course, culminating, many believe, in the famous categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant. The question is, or of course, the golden rule of, of the New Testament. Um, why should I treat people who are, in my estimation, stupider than me, lesser than me? Why should I be kind to those people? Like, what's the point of it? The ethics question. Finally, the third one that it seems to me, again, these are questions that uh, in the human existence, it seems to me these are natural questions for us, yes? The third one is the energy question, as I often will refer to it and have often in room 303. The question of what motivates you to expend the energy that you expend. For example, we've often given this word picture, let's give it one more time because we're going to come back to it in our study of Stoicism. The idea is that um, we, we uh, go to sleep at night, we wake up in the morning with good energy, we wake up uh, refreshed. That's like having a milk carton full of milk. And then throughout the course of your day, things happen. Starting in the morning, you get in a fight with your mom, for example, or whatever. Um, it's like somebody taking an ice pick and popping a hole in the side of your milk carton, and now you start to leak milk, okay? In our word picture, of course, milk is the energy. The obvious question is, by the end of the day, when, for example, I sit down to do those stupid, uh, you know, those stupid annotations for homework or whatever, I have virtually no energy, right? So the question is, how do I decide what to give my energies to? And, of course, this is what we will call, for your notes, the energy conservation model. And we're going to hear, uh, again and again, ideas about this energy conservation model. What's the best way to give your energies? Let's really quickly now just give a brief history of the Stoic philosophy, just so that we understand exactly kind of where, uh, where it comes from and, and that type of thing. Often it's misunderstood, in my estimation, and in a good number of other people as well, as a pessimistic view of life. It doesn't have to be read that way. And in fact, when we pick up Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, we're shocked right away at the number of times they keep talking about being happy. Okay, But by Marcus Aurelius, let's point out that Stoicism is in fact the way that the Greeks conquer the Romans. We know, of course, the Romans conquered the Greeks. But through Stoicism, uh, the extension of the Platonic theory, um, we're going to find that Stoicism is like an extension of Plato, and therefore Greek thought. And no question, the Romans are very influenced by the philosophy of the Greeks. Another way to say this is, Plato gets reworked, we might say it this way, which is why Alfred North Whitehead said, uh, maybe hyperbolically, that all of Western philosophy is basically a footnote to Plato and especially to Republic. Uh, certainly, Plato gets reworked. And we're going to see this in the Stoics. We're going to see this later in a, in a, a thinker named Plotinus. And then, of course, with St. Augustine and, and Christian uh, theology as well. The warrior code, you can write that one down in your notes, and of course that one will sound familiar to you because of our study of Beowulf, right? The warrior code, beginning of course with this notion of the Romans, then the Anglo-Saxons through of course Beowulf and our study of the Anglo-Saxon code with Beowulf, and then finally of course with our study of King Arthur and uh, the idea of the knight's code of what we call today of course chivalry, the idea of chivalry. The warrior code also will picture, and we're going to see this um, in our study of Epictetus as well as Marcus Aurelius, will picture their fundamental picture about what life is, is battle. 
and the battlefield itself. Um, life is like a battle. And of course, we immediately think of Longfellow's Psalm of Life in this world's broad field of battle in the bivouac of life. Be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. And of course, that idea that life is kind of a struggle, like a battle, immediately injects the theodicy question into our thinking, right? In other words, it's a war, it's a struggle. A struggle with what? Well, good and evil, right and wrong, however you wish to think of it. Very quickly, let's talk a little bit about Epictetus, just so that you have some background information. He is Greek-born, he's a slave, he ends up in Rome, where he finally derives his freedom. Uh, hard to say, but we think probably the dates are somewhere in common era, 65 to 135. Um, as a slave, there's all kinds of stories about Epictetus. There's one story that goes uh, that his master was, t was torturing him, uh, treating him badly, and Epictetus in a calm voice said, if you continue to do that, you're going to break my arm. He continues to do it. The arm is broken, and Epictetus just looks calmly at him and says, I told you you were going to break my arm. Uh, that probably is a contrivance, but... Uh, it, is a, it is an idea, at least, of, of kind of shows you the Stoic ideal lived out. We'll get to it in a little bit. Very much influenced by a cat named Rufus, who was a Stoic philosopher, and he begins to kind of extend that idea in his, in his famous stuff. He didn't write. He didn't leave anything in writing. And so, like Socrates and Christ, we have to, and many other great thinkers, we have to kind of rely and say thank you to a student who decided to write stuff down. In this case, it was uh, uh, someone named Arian who collected Epictetus' thoughts and his lectures and published them as the Discourses and Manual, as it's usually translated as. In the Harvard Classics, it's called the Golden Sayings of Epictetus because the, the, the primary ideas are extrapolated, and they'll be the ones that I'll be referencing here since we're, like, we're lecturing from a Harvard Classics edition. You can find this online, though, and you can, you can find your own um, quotes of Epictetus if you're so inclined. He very much, Epictetus, very much influenced Marcus Aurelius, of course, the Marcus Aurelius is probably the most famous spokesperson for Stoicism, at least today. Like Volume 1, let's point this out before we move on now into our study of Epictetus, and, and some of the comments that I made earlier about Volume 1, our study of Franklin, of Woolman, and Penn. Here, we're going to hear some challenging advice. You may not agree with it. In fact, I'm going to guess that some of this you won't agree with, but that's okay. I think, as I'm going to say at the end of my comments here, it's good to be disturbed, to be challenged, I believe, to have some, what I'm going to say, dissonance that occurs intellectually for you and spiritually, emotionally for you. And you're certainly going to see this here well, with, with Epictetus. Now, just to point out, I work from the assumption that you've not actually read any of the texts that we're talking about in our Harvard's classic lecture, but my goal is that if, if I can, I want to interest you enough in this information so that you can, uh, you know, uh, maybe go and look at it on your own, maybe do a bit of reading on your own in the live. All right, let's go to level one. We're going to look now at the, uh, at, at the information in Harvard Classics and Epictetus quotes and observations. Uh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and just give an overview, macro, to just get a sense of it. When we talk about Epictetus and his understanding of Stoicism, we basically have three elements that are going to obviously relate to those three elements that we were talking about just a few moments ago. But he had a certain order that he liked to talk about them, and so let's get them in your notes this way. He said that if you're going to follow his philosophy, which he rarely calls Stoic philosophy, he just calls it his view of life. The first one is you have to master or control your desires. You are what you want. This is, of course, what we will say, the energy question as we were looking at it before. In other words, you need to understand that those holes that go into the side of your milk carton that are created by contact with the outside world. I mean, it's inevitably going to happen throughout your day. Those holes that are created in the side of your milk carton are of two kinds. Either those holes are things that you can control or things that you can't control. If they are things that you can't control, then you have to let them go and not have anxiety or worry about them. If they are things that you can control, then control them. This will sound like a very rational, kind of logical approach to the notion of energy conservation. We'll talk more about it here in a bit when we look at Epictetus' uh, comments themselves. After you've mastered or controlled your desires, the second in his steps will be performing your duty. This is the ethics question. 
this will be for us in our study already of Plato and the notion of the cave allegory from Republic 7. You'll remember that we make this observation. If you see the people who you contact throughout your day as living in a cave where they're looking at shadows on a wall thinking that those shadows are in fact real, then it makes sense that you would not hate those people or loathe those people or see them as idiots or any of those things. But, well, as we pointed out in the lecture in, uh, uh, on Republic 7, think about what Jesus Christ in the story says from the cross. Forgive these people who are crucifying me. Why? Because they're sinners and nasty? No, 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 that's not what he says. He says, forgive them because they want... They're stupid. They're stupid. They don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant. This will be the Stoic answer as well. The Epictetus answer, the Marcus Aurelius answer will be, when you deal with people who are treating you badly, don't get mad at them because they are doing things out of stupidity, out of ignorance. And therefore, you have a duty as a citizen of the world, he'll call it, to love all men equally and women equally. This is going to be a powerful injunction early on in the history of Western thought that says, we're all brothers and sisters on this planet. We have to take care of each other. Even if we don't like each other, we still have to respect each other. Number three, if you can master and control your desires, if you can perform your duty, then finally you can begin to think correctly about yourself and the world, of course, that you live in. Now this obviously is the theodicy question. In other words, we have to learn how to ask the correct question. We'll say this at the end of our comments. It is so often the case that when bad things happen, people will often ask as their very first question, why did this happen to me? But the problem with that question is it never actually gets answered. Epictetus will point this out. No matter what answer you get as to why something happened to you, you can always come back with another question. Well, yeah, but why did that have to happen to me? The only real view of yourself when you ask, why did this happen to me, is to picture yourself as somehow a victim, where the world and the outside world is doing all this stuff to you, and you're somehow having to learn how to live with all of that, asking constantly, why, why me, why me, as opposed to, I let it happen to somebody else. You are a victim in your life if you ask, why did this happen to me? So you're going to hear Marcus Aurelius as well as Epictetus make this argument that the key is learning how to ask the right question. Not why did this happen to me, but change the preposition, why did this happen for me? It's not that we're going to argue that pain, yippee, great, I get to have pain and suffering in my life. No, no, no. If we can avoid it, we'll avoid it. But when it finally happens, and it will, because that's called the human existence, then the answer to the theodicy question will simply be for Epictetus and for Marcus Aurelius. You have to learn how to see pain and suffering as a probaduty, instruction, didactic. It's helping you in some way. Why? Because you will look at it as from the perspective of why did this happen for me? What can I learn from this experience? No matter how bad it is, can I learn? Can I grow? This will be a powerful comment now at the end. All right. Well, let's turn now specifically to some of the comments as we have done in previous lectures on uh, these different readings. I like to go to the text itself and to make some observations just at level 1 and 2a with these messages, trying to get some sense about what it is that he's saying. How about this one? A classic Epictetus line will begin. Try to enjoy the great festival of life with other men. There's two things I want to say about this one that I love. First of all, notice that we are talking again about Scooby Snacks, being happy. In other words, no, Stoicism is not walking around always sad because the world is basically a wretched place to live. No, no, no. But what I love about this line is the first word, try. You're not always going to be happy. No, of course not. But as much as within you lies, try and be happy with this great festival of life. We immediately think about Walt Whitman's classic poem, O oh Me, O oh Life, the answer that you exist, that life exists, that you exist, and that you can contribute a verse to the drama, to the poem. Let's keep going. Another classic line of Epictetus that I love, why? What am I? He asks this question about himself. And of course, this seems to be one of the penultimate questions of philosophy, right? Who are you? Whole systems of philosophy have been built around this simple question of trying to understand who you are. Listen to this one. Why? What am I? A wretched human creature with this miserable flesh of mine. Miserable indeed, but you have something better than that paltry flesh of yours. Why then cling to the one and neglect the other? Thou art but a poor soul 
laden with a lifeless body. Of course, we immediately think of uh, Yeats's poem, Sailing to Byzantium, as he talks about an aged man as but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless so clap its hands and sing, and louder sing, or sages standing in God's holy fires in a gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul, consume my heart away, sick with desire, and there the line is, fastened to a dying animal it knows not what it is. In other words, the Epictetus view is that there's two of you. This should sound familiar because of course when we did Plato's theory of the forms in our Phaedo lecture as well as in our Republic 6-7 lecture, the idea is that there's two of you. There's your body, but then there's this thing. What are you going to call it? Your soul, your mind, your spirit, your energy, which extends beyond, which is not a part of your body and yet is a part of your body. That is to say, you should take care of your soul as much as you take care of your body. We can hear his view of ethics when he talks about himself as a citizen of the world. That is significant because for Epictetus, a slave, this is remarkable to think about, a man who is tortured by his master, he will still make the argument that all of us are connected in some way. This is, of course, a powerful notion of that world-centric moral argument that we were making earlier, that we move, if we hopefully do evolve, from an egocentric to an ethnocentric to finally a world-centric view that says all of us on the planet are valuable. We think immediately, don't we, of John Donne's Meditation 17, no man is an island. We're all somehow connected. Don't ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for you. That is to say we're all somehow connected. A citizen of the world. We continue. Another passage that I enjoy very much. Listen to this one. If you choose, he says, you are free. If you choose, you need blame no person. Accuse no person. Wow. 